and, and joining and just really yeah just um feeling that and welcome who's who's making this live and um welcome to wherever we get to wherever we get to welcome for everybody that's going to watch this on catch up or anybody that does yeah welcome everyone yeah so i know we've just got a few things that a couple of things that we were both going to say just to presence us before we started but if it's okay with you this part of my system that's just enjoying seeing your face and just coming into connection with you for a moment so um Likewise. yeah 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 mm. Yeah, I'm noticing a lot more of a settling. Um, I'm just taking in your face, your smile, your presence. Yeah, I had some rest right before. Yeah. So, always nice to settle in. Yeah. Yeah. So just presencing that we're going to spend a little bit of time in embodied presence. You have something that you want to share to open the space. I'll share something to open the space. Um, and then we're also holding an intention just to hear how you're supporting your community. And um, and then I'll share some um, uh, thoughts um, and some kind of neuroscience around um, secondary trauma and um you know just ways in in a very humanistic ways that we can kind of support ourselves through that you know and not shaming what is a, a biological response so that's kind of where i come from with that yeah is that yeah i really appreciate you joe and it's beautiful to have this conversation mm -hmm. and just to model vulnerability together mm -hmm. in the live um, yeah we both were talking how we both get a little nervous with these kinds of formats and it's good to just jump into it and mm -hmm to find strength in being vulnerable and, and sharing. So I'm really honored to share this platform with you and to just model this live with people joining us from different places. So it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I feel that too. I appreciate you too. <sighs> so um, should I start with the, my opening? Yeah, I'd really, I'd really enjoy it if you start yeah. it. So um, I wanted to start by uh, sharing a practice that Muslims always do before they start anything, essentially. Muslims say this, it's the opening chapter of the Quran called Al-Fatiha, the open, opening chapter. And it's something that we say in every one of our prayers. It's something we recite when we start kind of group activities or any kind of activities we want to put the sacred into. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's very similar to the Lord's Prayer for Christians, for those people who are familiar with the Lord's Prayer, very similar meaning also of acknowledging that there's one God and, and we rely on God for everything, basically. And we're, we're helpless human beings um, who need the divine in our lives in order to carry on. So I'll recite in Arabic. I do not have a translation, unfortunately. Um, I could grab one, but I'll just, I think even just hearing the Arabic words uh, can be another yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iya ka na'abdu wa iya ka nasta'in. Ahlina surat al-Mustaqim. Surat al-Ladina na'amta alayhim. Ghayra ma'adhubi alayhim wa ladhaleen. Um, and we always, uh, in the somatic practice, but traditional Islamic practice, we always uh, kind of wipe the blessings of the prayer on our faces afterwards. And it's also, you know, ancient somatic practice in, in Islam, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've never heard you um, speak in Arabic before, so I enjoyed hearing hearing that from, from you. Thank you. 
Um, I just really wanted to present the words, um, some words that I share that have been um, with me um, for the last few weeks. And they're from um, the um, philosopher, I think he would best kind of, I think he calls himself a kind of trickster philosopher, Bayo Akamalofe, um, and his kind of question and inquiry, um, which is, how do we process the grief? How do we pray? How do we act? How do we think in ways that do not reproduce the conditions that nourish the dominant tendencies that have produced this war? So there's something about that for me that grounds in a little bit of what we spoke to before we come on this live, which was around moving through this from a, a heart space. Yeah, no, definitely. I was thinking, and I just, we were sharing some voice notes before this, and I was just, what came to my mind as I was on a walk just before this uh, live was the fact that right now what we're seeing online and, and in person is a lot of healing centered approaches to sharing these traumatic events and to talking about them and processing them. Um, instead of trauma-informed, instead of healing, heart-centered. And I think that's why people are, it's not only just we're carrying a lot of grief, but also to have a trauma-centered approach is, is harmful to us. It's difficult um, and it, it's not, it can't last, right? It's, mm. it's very harmful to continue in this trauma-centered approach. What, what what do you mean by that? Because I was curious, because that was the last voice note I got from you. And I was like, oh, I, I'm just going to, I think I get an essence yeah. of what you but I'd be curious if you could just share a little more for yeah. myself. Well, it goes well. with the quote you just talked about is how can we process this grief and this, these challenges without reproducing the very pain that, you know, caused it. Right. Mm. So for me, when I was thinking about that quote and just our conversation and preparing for this live, um, I was trying to process and I've been trying to process since October 7th, since everything started, um, I've been trying to process the the emotions and sensations I've been having in my body and my and the thoughts I've been having in my head and it's been a lot to process and I'm mm -hmm. I have not finished processing and and sitting with everything and some days like today I was pretty down you know I was kind of feeling just like complete complacent um, but I was trying to process like how watching the news and watching other people's reactions to the news and watching videos and pictures from Gaza how it's been affecting me not just the pictures alone but also people's interpretations and comments on the images on all the things affected that are that the Gazans are suffering and it's it's a lot right and so there's been a lot of just shared grief and trauma um, and it's we're centering the trauma which people we need to do in a way in order to bring awareness to what's going on so world leaders can cease can demand we can demand ceasefire for example but we're stuck in this flight or flight freeze state basically yeah. where if we just center the trauma and nothing else um we can't we're frozen in the state and we're all in a deep state where we can't do much we can't pro like i'm having difficulty processing and a lot of people i'm speaking to are having difficulty they're experiencing deep shame and guilt because they're not doing enough um mm -hmm. what can they do you know we're not world leaders these sorts of things yeah that's just like a little bit of kind of what came out of that that term i just randomly you know came up with trauma centered because i consider myself trauma-informed coach healing-centered coach and not trauma centered right trauma centered would be kind of more the um social justice warrior who they often burn out because yeah. they have they have too much of that too much of that and not enough care mm -hmm. yeah thank you for um just adding some extra um i i had a sense that that's where you're coming from but it, i yeah. think it's useful to sense that also because it brings into the room a little bit of what we're you know kind of going to move on to in terms of what trauma informed ways that can support people um you know in in, in these times and uh, uh, there's something that i want to present that has kind of like been um because we spoke again we've we've kind of shared some voice notes and 
I, I say this um, knowing that I am in a privileged position. I'm not in any of the affected areas, but I, I want to presence it because I think this might support maybe um, not even and support other people but I think there's just something about sharing very honestly about what is in some someone's direct experience what is in my direct experience that might maybe resonate or support with support or just resonate with others so there was part of me that um when we discussed doing this was like oh you know I don't I don't know enough I don't know enough right and I think that can be a place that can be very immobilizing um you know we can go into a place where of the mind where we want to get into all the nuance before we can comment or take you know reasonable reasonably informed action towards peace and i i started to get really curious like I noticed what was in my body there was some shame there was some freeze and again I realized that that's from a place of privilege but I'm sharing this very honestly towards others but there was something then I noticed this like I want to really grab for nuance I want to really understand all the nuance and then I kind of came back to my body and where I've kind of got to is there is a difference between wanting to get into detail and being able to hold nuance and they're very different so for me detail is a place of the mind which is binary can go back and forth we could go back and forth about um all of the horrors in the world all over you know not just in even in gaza there are so many horrors we could go back and forth about you know, you know right or wrong from that kind of binary place but when I sat in my heart and when I, in a embodied sense, in a resource sense, as resource as I could be, watched a mother in Gaza hold a dead child and cry, you know, and my, my heart bled with her, watched the thousands of um, Jewish people People who were in the station over the weekend in New York who were singing for peace and my soul sang with them and, and and all the other things and when I let my when I let my body really experience that on a deep level for me that's that's the sort of that's nuance that's being able to hold a lot of nuance and it's different to detail and being able to embody and hold nuance is a place where I feel that I'm showing up with the best of my ability and with the best of my ability to call out for peace. I, I don't think any of the, the detail stuff it, is that helpful right now for me. So, yeah. I, I hear you, Joe, and, and why I reached out to you because I knew that would be how you would approach this. You know, I, as someone who has a lot of experience and knowledge about this part of the world, but I'm not a political science expert. So I also don't want to be offering my political expertise on this because I don't know enough either. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't mm -hmm. want to know enough. Actually, I um, I want to feel the humanity of everyone who's who's grieving and and to be able to also hold space for people who are trying to fight the good fight and help others and support others in the way that they can. And I'm someone who comes from an academic background and, and very intellectual. And in the past, I was stuck in that cycle that you talk about, the intellectual cycle of numbers and facts. And it's important to know and to have knowledge, but mm -hmm. also just to experience, you know, like you said, the, the I saw that those videos of the, of the Jewish community, Jewish Voices for Peace singing in the in, was it Union Station, New York City, and, and the parents in Gaza crying over their, their children who were bombed in their apartment buildings, like it just, that's humanity, you know, mm. and, and, and also in Congo, and I mean, the, and Darfur, I mean, it just, like it goes on, where, where do we stop, right? Where do we stop except to acknowledge each person's humanity and to experience it in a, in a visceral way? Uh, of course, not allowing ourselves to be taken over, 
um, mm. but just to acknowledge and hold space for everyone's humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's part of me, as you say, that I'm just checking in on, you know, how my own system is doing, and there's part of me that just as I hear you say that, just like wants to take a big breath, um, you know, and the, and a little activation around, you know, just a, a little bit as we're kind of starting to you know bring in examples of suffering mm -hmm. you know how can that not be yeah. and I, I also just want to speak to that in terms of um you know when we go on to the um you know ha you know being with secondary trauma and some of the ways that we can be with that how i hold that is and people can agree with this or disagree with this because I don't think every nervous system expert would agree with it. But how I hold that is um, being regulated should not be a way to whitewash the humanity out of us. Mm -hmm. it, shouldn't, it does not mean do not deeply feel emotions. It does not mean um n not being able to deeply hold compassion and grief and anger in, in actual fact it means the opposite of that for me it means being able to hold that in an embodied sense that isn't fractured that doesn't start um you know attacking or withdrawing or having other ways of being but actually being able to embody that because i don't think that is a way to talk about this without touching into emotions so i just there's something about being regulated which for me is a vehicle to be able to metabolize emotions rather than kind of whitewashing them because i you know that there is an emotional quality to this and that's part of our humanity being able to touch into that yeah i agree um a regulated human is someone who can hold space for others, who can hear people um, better, um, who can engage with people in a more beautiful way, I find. Because um, I'm thinking what's happening a lot with people is that they're so dysregulated and they're not quite aware of that. They're just feeling so much, so many emotions that are passing through them really quickly, you know, all and a lot of negative emotions. And then they're um not venting they're expressing these emotions in ways that are also triggering the same emotions in other people too and it's just um a lot of people are affected by even just one person with a dysregulated nervous system so it's a gift to oneself and to everyone around us yeah um to to work on um on that um and it's not it doesn't mean we always have a regulated nervous system but no. we try to stay it, and bring ourselves to that point when we can yeah right yeah exactly exactly beautiful i'm just gonna actually pop on the light because i'm <laughs> yeah you're getting a bit dark from spain as you know from my mum's and i just I'm, I'm just sort of realizing that here um it's becoming dark so let me just pop on the light because a bit of darkness otherwise how's everyone doing who's with us now hey what is if you can say one word to describe your state what is your state like right now oh that's much better joe just see if any responses come in from that question i heard that question before There's something that um, has just come up for me about um, just a real simple gratitude was, you know, like there's, um, you know, where women with different lived experiences, different academic experiences, you know, and there's a, just a, a gratitude to be here with you in embodied presence just you know being being together and being able to 
to to speak in this way yeah I, i'm really grateful and you know when it first happened it was like a week and a half ago i had two sharing circles online and then last week i had um an event for muslim women uh, that was about bringing compassion to our lives. And I'm just feeling it's really important to have people doing this kind of work, what you and I are doing, because there's so much of this trauma-centered approach online. And we also need to see reminders like what we're doing here, that we're also of our humanity, of the need to care for ourselves. Uh, because I, I saw Shweta, she just said she's experienced like a lot of grief and she's enraged. You know, and it's it's a very normal emotion to have right now. I'm also experiencing the same the same emotions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a cat visitor. Um, let's see, do you want to say hi, Mona? There you go. She's going to join us. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I find it really valuable to be able to and important that I work on myself and notice myself and notice when I go down and when I'm doing okay because. I'm trying to also support other people like you are, right? Um, so that we can keep on, we can keep on moving in our lives and living our normal lives, mm -hmm. as well as trying to find ways to feel like we're doing something that we're even just acknowledging the humanity and mm -hmm. praying if we can for people suffering. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you supporting your community, Rose? What's yeah, like I said, that I've, I've been holding these these yeah. events uh, sharing circles the first one was two different one one was just for Muslim women one was for anyone um, and that was really powerful because it was early on um, I forget the date and pe people needed a place to talk about all their emotions and their thoughts um, especially uh, Muslims and I usually do Muslim women I usually hold spaces for Muslim women because it's actually they don't feel very safe most of my community is are north american muslim and they're not feeling safe right now in canada and the u.s particularly um there's muslim politicians being attacked for supporting the palestinians for example being called to step down from the position there was a six-year-old boy um you know who was killed in chicago because he's palestinian american so right now muslims in canada the u.s are feeling really um, they're feeling like targets, they're feeling um, threat, threatened. A lot of women who wear headscarves or hijabs are feeling very unsafe, mm -hmm. and there have been some attacks um, other than the ones I mentioned. Um, so the first, and, and also whenever they say anything about Gaza, then they're called, then people accuse them of being terrorists or supporting terrorists, right? So they need a space where they can just process stuff without being called certain things, just to say the things they wanted to say, you know? Um, so that's the first thing is they needed to just talk without being censored, without being attacked or criticized. Because um, in many forums in public in the United States or Canada, they can't publicly mm. talk about this very easily without having their jobs at stake, without you know having their lives threatened even. Um, college campuses has gotten very ugly. Um, and then during last week when I held every day, I had a session for them, uh, women who needed a compassionate space and to bring more compassion to their lives. We, we worked on different orientation practices, somatic and breathwork practices. I was like teaching them some things that they could do when they are experiencing the very intense emotions and the stress and anxiety. Um, and then we just talked about different um, topics. But in each day, the focus was compassion. But we also I also made space for talking about their emotions and thoughts regarding Palestine um, because it's just on everyone's mind so deep and so heavy, and they're really needed that space again to even process how they feel moving about in their lives and how they can talk about it and how they can not shame themselves because mm. um, a lot of them experience this deep guilt and deep shame that they're not doing enough that they're not good enough because other people are saying if you're not doing this then you're not what are you doing you're you're silent you know and there's a lot of that approach online and so they've been really affected by that and re helping people realize that they can only do what is within their capabilities, you know? Um, I think a lot of us feel guilt and shame that we're not stopping it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't have the ability personally to stop what's happening. Um, I can write a letter to my congressperson, although I don't live in the United States anymore, I could still write a letter to my congressperson in California. Um, you know, I can do all kinds of things, but I, 
I decide personally that my role, and I did some, made some videos about this, my role can be to support people who are doing some really beautiful work to support Palestinians, especially. Um, that's what I could do the best, right? And so that's why I've decided and committed myself to doing during these mm -hmm. days is supporting giving space for people to talk and be heard and witnessed mm -hmm. and learn some techniques to help themselves through this mm -hmm. how about yourself i'd love to hear more about how you're supporting your community yeah and more about secondary trauma as well yeah well maybe move on to the secondary yeah. trauma I, I i thank you for sharing that and um there's with my community you know that they're, they're in in america you know i have i have community that i serve over there and, and in europe and you know this is i i think this is actually just a really useful point to to note that even though people have different lived experiences you know the the, the body and the physiological system and some of the responses to what's happening can actually be shared and 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 understood from that sense so there's there's um you know a lot of my, my community i kind of you know i've done a community circle speaking to people in my community one-to-one -one, supporting people in that way i'm probably going to do another community circle when i'm back next week so i've been away for a little bit but one of the um things that i notice is around is um a real and this is something that i presenced with you as well you know a real kind of reticence to shame um and you know shame can have like a shame one of my teachers talks about this as is a mixture of um freeze and intense emotions it's like the coupling of freeze and an intense emotion which can be really it, which can be a hallmark of, of secondary trauma can be survivor guilt you know or just kind of some form of guilt taking in that and if we have some shame in our system latent which most of us do it can turn that guilt then into shame and there is a lot of shame around you know like not doing enough there's also shame about being afraid to actually speak up and i don't even necessarily mean speak up online because that's just not always even helpful right sometimes it's really counter helpful but just to speak up and to be able to talk about what's happening in community with families and i think there's a um there's a fear which is one that that i held which i presenced with you about not not wanting to cause anything that would lead to a rise in anti-semitism anti-semitism as well as you know any 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 other kind of backlash and and i think that you know comes from a place of freeze and it mm -hmm. comes from a place of latent shame and maybe helplessness you know and kind of being in that helpless state and letting that um be the predominant factor rather than feeling into the heart space being resourced and feeling into a positive action forward for mm. justice for holding space for others and i you know there 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 is there's that there's also in my community you know just very again very similar shame for like not being able to do enough for uh, palestinians not being able to process the grief and just having a lot of shut down with you know shock and horror about what's going on so i'm just going to take a little pause there because it's just a little little bit of my system that just got a little bit activated just kind of presencing that Yeah, if you're watching this, then now's a good time to take an intentional breath mm. through your nose if possible. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's really hard to talk about this topic because mm. every time I talk about this topic, I want to center Gazans or Gazans, mm. and and to make sure you know I'm taking a strong stance. Mm. Um, but sometimes, you know what, Joe? I just I was thinking today. I feel like going and renting a cabin in the woods and leaving, like just ignoring humanity, because it's like humans are can be so awful to one another. And I was like, I have nothing to do with humans right now. <laughs> They're just like so terrible. Like, can I just like go ignore the world and live in my little cabin? That's kind of like, it came, it was one of the thoughts that came to my head today, to my mind today, because I was like, enough. Can I just disconnect from the internet, from social media and put my head in the ground? And, and of course that's not the answer either, mm. right? But sometimes I feel like doing that. Mm. But I know yeah. that's not my calling to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hear that. I, I, I really hear that. Uh, and, and I think that wanting to, I think there is also like, you know, just some useful discernment there, right? About listening to sometimes a, a need to pull away for a while to resource, you know, to stay engaged, to support your community, but also to, to, to unplug and to resource and discerning the difference between that which I know you do but I'm just presencing it as a yeah. sort of white conversation between that and the and the utter withdrawal which which is a movement of shame often exactly. you know it, it, it's hard to talk about it yeah um yeah so Joe I'm so curious because I know that you have so much experience with this and you know what I've from what I've shared from about what my, my community is experiencing and what your community is experiencing. There's really, this is what we call secondary trauma, right? Yeah. Like being frozen, like not having all these emotions that they're unable to process. They, they, they're having difficulty coping, their hearts are so heavy. So I'd love to know how do you support people with, um, through secondary trauma? What, is, what are some pieces of advice or how can people work through this, function in their daily lives? Well, holding space for people who are suffering like lessons. A hundred percent. So I, I, I will share with you the, the definition from a, a physiological perspective, which from SE, which is what the definition of, of secondary trauma is. And then I'll kind of speak to that through various kind of models, lived experience, experience as a practitioner into, um, into, you know what can support people sorry i just saw a comment there and i just got a little bit distracted so just coming back to just coming back to a bit of center secondary trauma so and i think even just presencing that this is a thing can be really useful because it, it brings us to a point of being able to just have enough insight to not get lost in the neuroscience or lost in the the um academic kind of nature of what I'll speak to but just enough insight to know ah ah this is a thing so that we can then be actually attentive to our um, animal body and to and to our soft hearts so secondary trauma is classed as um, and includes experiences in which someone has witnessed or been party to horrific events seeing an accident um, especially with blood or gore or watching someone else being abused, killed or similar. This includes taking in, you know, now we have got so much access in the world to, um, to, to, to events and we can see what's happening in Gaza. We can see what's happening in other parts of the world in a way that we've never been able to. And it's actually, it's such a lot for our animal bodies to take in, especially when you know we can't necessarily mobilize to bring in the, the defense responses that we might, that our animal body kind of needs to bring in. So I think just presencing that, what it is, and that it is actually a thing can be supportive to help people go, ah, okay, let me now tend to this. 
some of the kind of common symptoms are especially when we're taking in a lot in the news is like a kind of constriction in the eyes so again i'll just presence this to see if this just to, to you know give a bit of insight and then i'll talk about some tools constriction in the eyes shoulders back muscles like a really braced spine i've noticed that quite a lot um, um survivor guilt which we've touched on a little bit can be a real thing and it can provide a lot of um like dilemma in the system mm -hmm. which has this kind of stuck and freeze um element to it a feeling of helplessness and rage kind of coupled together um which can feel very enmeshed and again can have a sort of freezy impact on the system not one not being able to come out and freeze generally is really really strong mm -hmm. so you know i think um what, what i've noticed in my experience is that speaking to the the guilt and the shame and just really being compassionate about that you can really support so so shame doesn't like company basically mm -hmm. you know it, it it can be really um dissolved if you like if that's the right word or metabolize is probably a word mm -hmm. that i that I use more if there are compassionate spaces for people to to be heard so whatever your experience is there is no right there is no wrong way to to be alive in the world at this moment in time and taking in the news there is no right or wrong way for you to feel and shame might allow you to think that there is and there isn't so finding compassionate people who can listen. So joining circles like yours, Rose, um, you know, I'll do one of them when I get back or just places that will be able to hold you in a place of non-judgment or a friend, you know, and say, I just want to be able to speak. I don't want answers. I don't want solutions. Can I share with you how, how I'm feeling? That in a way starts to uncouple some of um the shame from some of the things that it might be coupled to so for example shame kind of has this um movement and i can kind of recognize some of those in myself and some in my community and some from what you some of you spoke to so shame can have as kind of denying or kind of disassociating you know maybe spiritually bypassing some of kind of what's going on no shame on any of this by the way it's just be mindful and just notice and get curious about if it is having some of this movement it can have this kind of like hot potato um blame criticize that can kind of attack um it can self attack it can go inwards in this like you know i'm not doing enough um i'm going to say something wrong if i speak out i'm going to do something wrong that kind of um that's one that i really can connect with on a very direct ex direct experience personal level that's sort of how it tends to operate with me or it can withdraw you know it can kind of just pull want to really pull away from all connection so i, I share this as information um not as a how i hold these things are it's a map not a territory so now you've like maybe heard the map see if any of that get curious about the territory of how that is if any of that is relevant in your body and with shame because it is this mixture of primal emotion and freeze movement movement find a compassionate person to talk to who can witness you with no judgment and move and it doesn't even have to be any like here's a big somatic practice right mm -hmm. just notice am i like locked in are my eyes a bit like this am i feeling a bit rigid am i noticing some shame it's probably time to move you know i just whack on a playlist <laughs> you know and listen to listen to a playlist and have a dance mm -hmm. or you know go for a walk look at the horizon as well if you can if you're in a position where you can take in a little bit of the horizon whilst you walk um one thing that um shame also does and just 
trauma generally robs us of hope and when we can look at a horizon that can somatically and when we are walking it can bring in a sense of mobilization and a little bit of hope so i tend to try and you know if i am in an area where i can just really check out a bit of horizon mm -hmm. and also look from side to side then mm -hmm you know, that can be really supportive as well. Let me just take a little conscious breath because there's some other little somatic practices that I can share, but I just didn't know if you had to, wanted to respond to that in any way or just say, you know, it, if any of that resonates or, yeah, I just wanted to give you a bit of space. It definitely resonates with me and it's the same thing, you know, I recommend to people is uh, one really easy, you know, easy way. Uh, also, I love my private, I call them my private dance parties, you know, and, and movement because a lot of us are sedentary beings nowadays. You know, I work from home, I'm assuming you mainly do too. And, and our ancestors were moving a lot and doing physical activities to sustain their lifestyles. And now we sustain our lifestyle by working on the computer and, and sitting and, and so we don't move a lot. And I think it, so it even impacts us even more for those of us who are sedentary and that movement is even more powerful mm -hmm. um, because for physical health, we're not moving enough, but then also for our emotional and spiritual health, movement is so powerful. I mean, I found my healing through movement, um, literally by going, uh, leaving my intellectual side behind because it wasn't helping me on my healing path and I had to go down into my body. Mm. Um, and embrace like feeling everything in my body and, mm. and yes so I resonate completely with what you're saying beautiful I just want to give another technique as well actually and this might support people that maybe um you know maybe are not inhabiting bodies that, that are able to walk outside or to dance and um, but if you can if you're in a position where I'll give a couple of different choice points for this so if you're in a position where you can sit on the um ground and i'll maybe do one and you maybe do another so i'm going to do one where i move my hips but this one is if you're sat on a chair and if you've got your feet on the floor paddle your feet as if you're as if you're walking all the while with somatic practices it's about being attentive it's not just doing the motion but it's about being attentive to what is happening in the rest of the system whilst doing that so just presencing that bit but move um move your feet like you're paddling your feet like you are walking and say the words out loud even though i'm feeling stuck i notice i'm moving my feet or something similar but the key thing is even though i'm feeling stuck right now my, my feet are moving i'm noticing that i'm moving my feet keep on doing that whilst watching the system move and that's sending up like new um making new neural pathways sending up signals to the brain that even though the body is in a bit of there is movement available and it can start to really metabolize some of that stock and that that mm -hmm. free and maybe a bit of shame that goes with it as well that's a good one that i kind of use all the time and i'm sat just on the floor here because it's the only place that I could sort of get at my mum's that was um, quiet to do this. So I uh, another way to, that can you can do this do this this with any body part, but I'm just going to do it with my hips, which are quite a big center, big part of the body to 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 actually be in movement. So it's a, another good way. So you're, even though I'm feeling stuck, I notice that my hips are moving, and you can see there was just you know there's big breath there which looking out for these big breaths mm -hmm. is often a sign that mm -hmm. the body as you know was i'm just i'm just present in this for everyone else is a sign that something is kind of recalibrating and reorganizing in the system mm -hmm. and there's there's something that i want to say to um to um to what happens when we start to move through a little bit of a freeze, we can actually start to get in contact with a little bit of um, fight response, which is, if you don't like the word fight, particularly in the, these um, moments in time, it's actually defense, right? It's actually a defense mm -hmm. response. Um, so, um, and then what can come up with that is um 
emotion as an anger and at anger as an emotion and it the it's different anger and fight response or the defense response of fight is different to emotion but emotion does fuel um often so that anger can fuel that physiological um fight response and again if you don't like the word fight think about it as a defense because this is what it is and that, that can be really good you know like it, it it's it you know one as we presenced we're human and you know right now um anger is in the air with a lot of other emotions but can we stay with ourselves can we be with ourselves long enough can we get alongside that in a really compassionate way and be compassionate witnesses for ourselves that allows us to then utilize that into a, a, a positive defense response mm -hmm. that can be you know whatever is within your capabilities of, of doing so that doesn't necessarily mean you know being a keyboard warrior but you know might mean some real positive call to action to galvanize to you know be like the people who met in um new york station to be like the people who are protesting um in london i know just here in barcelona at the weekend as well there were seventy thousand people to write to your mp to call to your mp to you know engage in something that feels um like a um a, a, a movement an orientation it has some energy rather than the the kind of stuck freeze so you know be curious and try and kind of get alongside that if that comes up and i say that as someone as a as a woman who's spent um i'm 47 now <laughs> i've probably spent 40 years trying to um you know and embodying anger in a way because you know many women many people who are who identify as women or have been socialized as women in particular have um disowned anger mm -hmm. um and i can certainly connect with that but it can be a real transformational form yeah. for good yeah absolutely so um and one thing that um i'm always curious about when i'm working with people and i've noticed this kind of shame come in you know, the shame has this kind of like posture, which is a little bit like this, you know, the head is, it is down, there's a very inward cycle. I'm always kind of encouraging people to sit a bit like this. And this is something that I think people, you know, in your community, Rose or anybody that is, um, you know, affected, um, and is human in these times and feels helpless. So I'll do it against a wall. So this can be nice to do it against a wall. So to sit against a wall, feeling the support of the wall, noticing here, noticing the width of the body and noticing the length of the spine mm -hmm. and really tuning into that as an embodied um, posture of the opposite of helplessness and really spending some time there i'm trying that against the pillows yeah i was a little hunched and that feels that feels good yeah i've just seen the time <laughs> we did go over quite um yeah a bit but so let me I'll just take a little there are some other things I might um do another live or you know if, if there's any support that I can give to your community directly Rose or to or to you obviously just we'll we can exchange some messages after yeah definitely yeah. I thank you and, and as a certified breathwork practitioner I want to remind people that we have the breath with us every moment of our lives and when we harness it intentionally and consciously it can also really help us move through some difficult times i mean ever since i've started the journey of the breath i've been so grateful 
um, that I know how to harness it and how to use it in a way that can um, help me stay regulated and get through a lot of difficult times too. So I think combined the somatic practices combined with that intentional breathing is enormously powerful and, and um, yeah, I really appreciate the practices you shared and coupled with the breath um, yeah. is, is something that I hope more of us will bring into our lives, especially before we go online, after we go online, um, so that we don't allow it to dominate our lives, mm -hmm. the narrative online. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling now? Yeah, I feel, um, yeah, I feel good. I'm, I'm really enjoying having my back against the wall. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm feeling really just, it's, it feels really uplifting to speak with you and to speak with you in a way that other people will benefit from our conversation, um, to talk about in a vulnerable way, the, the emotions that we're kind of experiencing them and what other people in our community are feeling. Um, and then to also give practical techniques, right? I think that's the most important thing is to talk about, to give a name to what people are experiencing, secondary trauma. Because I think people are like, why am I feeling awful right now? Why am I feeling depressed? And people already have normal everyday issues and family and all kinds of things going on. But this added level is, is something that just like added a huge burden on people um, who already have a lot going on in their lives. So I think just what you did is naming it and describing it and then talking about ways that we can work through it, I feel is very empowering. So I'm very appreciative of this conversation, Joe. Mm, no, likewise, I really appreciate your presence and yeah, thank you for, yeah. Thank you for being you. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Um, there is, um, I think there's some people that wanted to watch on catch up. So I'll, um, in my very non IT way, um, we'll save it. But I'll save it. Yeah. And I'll probably, oh, how do I save I think it for a minute? And we go cancel or cancel it and then share immediately. Yeah. So um, I, I'll do that. And, um, yeah, just really sending out. There, there's something about me that, that, you know, wants to say that this, you know, that the coming into the embodied anger, being able to kind of mobilize in some really positive action mm -hmm. um, is really, really useful. And also I don't really want to overlook that that piece around praying because i think that's a really um i think the linear mind and some of the sort of dominant tendencies that we have in the world so that you know praying is maybe useless what's praying gonna do um but i don't feel uh, that's not how i hold mm -hmm. that i hold something that can connect us to um and i know i'm talking to the choir here so I'll maybe probably just let you speak I'll let you speak on that but there's something for me that I just wanted to presence around you know people can uh, mobilize in in different ways and and also prayer has 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 meaning I, I, I'll actually hand over to you yeah. and see if you want to say anything about that 100% I mean in Islamic tradition you know if we can we should do something with our hands, our body to change, to make change. Uh, if we can't, you know, use our tongue, you know, to try to make change. And if we can't, we always have prayer and we, we leave it to the divine because it can't, it's not always something that we can directly can change, but everything is in the hands of the divine, of the compassionate creator. And so at the end of the day, prayer is incredibly powerful. Um, and I think that it can create change and enough people praying for positive change, I think can create um, positive change in this world, you know, so um, I don't allow myself to feel completely hopeless because if I can't do anything and I can do more than prayer, but I can also pray mm -hmm. and keep that a constant. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Joe. I look forward to continue this conversation and thank you to everyone who's joined us in this Instagram live. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Take care of yourselves, everyone. I'll like
that you close it off. I'm going to do this thing now where <laughs> the, X, the X at the top. The X, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's rose.